when you took over, when you started at the NASDAQ, it was in 2003, so it was uh, after the tech bubble burst. The index was around 2,000. Would you have imagined that to close out the decade, we'd be talking about 9,000 today? I wish I could say I had imagined that, but no, I really could not conceive of, the, of that back in 2003 or 2004. It's been remarkable. Um, in terms of the NASDAQ composite, 2,700 companies weighted by market capitalization. If you actually look at uh, the companies that have been powering this move, almost a third of the entire index's weighting is coming from five names. It's Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Alphabet, specifically the Class C shares. How sustainable is this move above 9,000 when you think about it in those terms? Well, I think it's very sustainable because you have to understand that these companies, not just those five, they're fundamentally based upon technology, and their marginal revenue dollar tends to drop to the bottom line. And one of the questions I've been wrestling with is you have GDP growth at around 3 percent, the market growing up around 30 percent. How do you reconcile those two factors? And in the research I've done, you see that the Dow uh, Jones index correlated to the GDP growth kind of fell apart 10 years ago. And really now you have to look at revenue growth relative to how uh, yeah. the GDP is related to that. And if you see that, understand the business model of the technology companies, you can certainly see a very strong path forward. Yeah, and it certainly feeds into another point I, I know you make, which is that tech innovation is really bringing in, it's ushering in a new economy. How do you think about it? Well, when you look at the world, if we have 3% GDP growth, and that correlates to 3% revenue growth, right, and that's what we've witnessed the last 10 years, you have, to have rec you have to recognize that 3% revenue growth could easily drive 10% profit growth. And that's what you see the top NASDAQ companies have. Right? So if you have 10% profit growth and then you amplify that by other measures, certainly dividends and uh, share buybacks, you can certainly see NASDAQ going a lot higher than 9,000. I got to get your thoughts on some of the discussions, some of the proposals we've gotten this year around. Um, I guess for lack of a better word, um, bringing private market investments to the public market, whether it's direct listings, whether it's SPACs, whether it's now the SEC proposing giving more investors access to private markets in general. Are we starting to see the lines blur and how does that play out? Well, I would say this. I am strongly opposed to the SEC opening up private markets to regular retail investors. I think that will end in tears. When you look at the private market investing, and I do a lot of that today, uh, you don't see what we call common stock. Every stock is some kind of preferred with some kind of liquidation preferences. And it takes bankers and lawyers to really understand that. Now, I'm fortunate to have those kind of research uh, re, uh, resources available to me. But that's not available to most investors. And even those professional investors who have those resources obviously can get it quite wrong, as we saw with WeWorks. So I would say the thought of a regular investor trying to invest in private companies where the cap table is quite complicated uh, will definitely end in tears. The only way I can see a path to doing this is to make sure these investors don't directly invest in private companies, but have a company such as Blackstone or Carlyle there representing them in the marketplace. But you have to understand, it is not the public markets. You have information asymmetry, and the cap table is typically weighted against you. It's interesting to hear you talk about it that way. It, it doesn't sound like you think there's some sort of valuation reckoning coming within the private markets right now, especially on the heels of well, WeWork. Well, you, you, you see that certainly in the post-WeWorks era. The private market valuation is different than the public market. Common stock is different than preferred stock. So when you see these private market valuations, you have to recognize that there's a contract related to that. And there's economics in the terms in that contract that doesn't really uh, translate directly into the per share price. A public market valuation, you have common stock, you have a price, and there's no extra terms to it. You can buy and sell it and sell in two days. Uh, so it's really somewhat apples and, and oranges, right? When you have these large investors making private market investments, they're not just buying generic common stock, right? And you have to recognize that, and there's a valuation gap associated with that.
Although we're back to the argument then again, Bob, about why average investors should be locked out of the period where these companies are going through hyper growth. I mean, the only solution other than this would be to say, well, then let's shorten that window to IPO. But that clearly isn't happening yet. Yeah, but I, I understand that. And I understand everybody wants to get on the winners. But we have to uh, study the fact that most of these early stage companies uh, fail. Right. So you see the common information you read is about 92 percent of startup companies fail. My research shows it's probably around 60 percent. Well, let's call it 50 percent. That means that 50 percent of the time the retail investor is putting their money in, they can uh, land up with a goose egg. This has to then be money that they can lose and not think about 10 minutes later. Right. And that's a very narrow window for investors. So I think the greater good, because it's always a question of gray, not black and white, but the greater good is obviously to let the investors be protected, not get in a situation where there's information asymmetry. And even if they had all the information, the chances of winning is still only 50 percent uh, best case. As I said, if you can have a company such as Blackstone represent you and pay the fee associated with that representation, you could argue that's a decent way to go. Or if you had an ETF representing a basket of these where you yeah. weren't picking the one winner out of 10, then I could you know, get behind that in some fashion. But to think yeah. a regular investor is going to make a choice and pick a stock and happen to be right, okay. right? happen to pick the Facebook, that, that we don't want to see.